Let's just get our hearts ready here. Father, now work in our hearts and minds, Lord, through your word. Um, help me to be clear on the message of Philippians. And then, Lord, just drive the truth home that you've been talking to us for months now from this incredible book. So, again today, Lord, teach us. and Remind us of those specific things maybe that we each need to work on. As you complete the work you began in us. What a great truth. Thank you, Father. In Christ's name, I ask you. Amen. Amen. I don't know. I didn't, I didn't count them, but I think it's been about, I think 17 messages we did Philippians. Do you guys remember how many? I didn't think you would. So, um... <clears throat> If I can't remember, <clears throat> excuse me. So I, I want you to think, when, when I was a kid, my brother and I, he was, there, there were six of us that grew up together. You know, six brothers, there were six brothers and sisters grew up together. And my brother's a year and a half older than me. Him and I were inseparable as kids. We were very close in age and interests. And we did everything together. We did a lot of fighting. We did a lot of um, quasi-illegal stuff, um, as most boys in the 60s and 70s did. I mean, I remember we got BB guns when I was 10 years old, and we were hiking up on Peavine Mountain, which is north of Reno, and he shot me in the backside. And so I turned around, I turned around, just pulled the trigger and shot him in the tooth and chipped his tooth. <clears throat> this is back when dads beat children. So <clears throat> we both got a whooping. So... <laughs> um, and one thing we used to do also was, you know, just all kids did this. When you're, when you're drinking, you play outside, it's hot, and you go to the garbage, you go to the, um, Lucas is reminding me if you need a Bible. So if you, if you want a Bible, please raise your hand or bring it to you. And maybe if you don't usually use a Bible or your phone, get one today because we're going to fly through the book of Philippians. Be good to turn pages. Raise your hand and Lucas will give you a Bible. Or the ushers will give you a Bible. Thank you, Lucas. But you know, when you're a kid, you're playing, it's hot outside, and you go to the garden hose, you turn it on, you turn it on, it's a small flow so you can drink from it. And then what does your brother do? <laughs> just, you know, just cranks it so he just splashes all over your face. Well, today's message is going to be a lot like that. <laughs> it's going to be a ton of it. It's like drinking out of a fire hose today. Because I'm going to recapsulate the entire book of Philippians. I said 30 minutes, I was lying. Probably be closer to 40. Um, but stay with me. It's, you, have a, you have an outline in your bulletin. It's very aggressive. I'm not going to cover every point, but I put that in there. Um, but I just want to, to recap everything we've done. This, this book has seriously affected my walk with Jesus. I didn't know how much it would. I, I really didn't. You, know, you, you plan these things out. I go, oh, I like Philippians. Let's do that. And now, three, four months into it, I realize, wow, God, you taught me an incredible amount of what it means to pursue Christ. So, what I'd like to preface this talk with is um, the book of Philippians encapsulates for me a life, <clears throat> sorry, that the follower of Jesus needs to be utterly, 100% devoted to pursuing him and becoming like him. And I think a lot of our Western Christianity is more about doing the minimum. Minimally engaging God to the point where let's, let's, I can go to heaven someday. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not accusing anybody. It's, it's in me, it's in all of us. Um, so today what I want us to take serious, like every week, is am I pursuing Jesus with all I have and all I am? And to become like him. And am I willing in those areas of my life that fall short, which are many, um, to listen to his spirit and commit to giving those areas of my life to his glory also? So I preface it with that. So the theme of the book of Philippians, <clears throat> pressing on to be mature followers of Christ, pressing on to become mature followers of Christ. Paul, I'm going to read to you what I think is the central verse that projects or suggests this, this theme. I'm going to start in three, chapter 3, verse 12. And Paul has just mentioned in chapter 3, verse 11, the previous verses, how he is waiting for the resurrection when God will make him perfect, make him like Jesus Christ. So this is the context. So verse 12, he says this, not that I've already obtained this or I'm already perfect. You agree? 
Yeah, so, so, so we're on a journey, but we haven't obtained the perfection that comes with the resurrection. Um, but here's what he says. But I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. And another translation says this, I press on to grab hold of that for which Christ grabbed hold of me. It's an, it's an incredible way of thinking right now. Jesus has come and entered into your life, radically changed it, and said, I now have a purpose for your life. Your purpose is Christ-likeness. Your purpose is becoming like me. In all your thoughts, and all your actions, and all your motives, it's becoming like me. That's what I've grabbed you for. And Paul is saying, now I want to grab that for which Christ grabbed hold of me. That's his point. <clears throat> Although, let me back up here. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That, for me, encapsulates the theme of this book. I press on. The word press on is an intense word. It's an intense word that, that, that suggests all-out commitment. In fact, Paul uses it earlier in chapter 3 and verse 6 when he talks about his pedigree and how, 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 how committed he was to Judaism. And one thing he said, I was a persecutor of the church. As far as zeal goes, I was so zealous I persecuted the church of Jesus Christ. The word persecute there is the same word as the word press on. It's one's a noun, one's a verb, but it's the same word group. So there's a positive and negative side to it. This is a word that describes a persecutor, someone who persecutes someone else. And Im imagine the zeal it must take to persecute someone. To hate something so much that you put all your energy into stopping that person or that belief system. Paul used that word in chapter 3, verse 6. Now he shifts it and said, that's who I used to be. But now, with that same intensity and zeal, I'm pursuing Jesus and all that he has for me. I forget what lies behind and I stretch, I reach out as far as I can to grab hold of that for which Christ grabbed hold of me. So that's the theme of the book. <clears throat> that does not allow any lukewarmness. That does not allow any idea of adding Jesus to our life. That is telling us Jesus is our life. And everything in our life must be filtered through his glory. So there's a dichotomy here though. You see, God, chapter 1, let's go to chapter 1 now. That was just the introduction, by the way. Chapter 1, God will accomplish this ultimate salvation in us, but it is a participatory process. Okay, we talked about this a lot. God is the one who accomplishes this in us. He will do it. Chapter 1 makes that very clear. He will start the good work he, he will finish the good work he started in you. But all through the Philippians is talking about how you engage the process. Remember we talked about the precipice? Remember we showed you a picture of us hiking up on Cloud's Rest in Yosemite? And there was this, there was this um, granite precipice where it was a couple thousand feet down each side. Um, we must engage God in our salvation. To one side is what's called legalism and self-righteousness. I'm doing it. I'm accomplishing my salvation. And the answer to that is what? No way. God accomplishes it. But the other side is what's called antinomianism or lawlessness. It doesn't matter what I do because I'm going to be saved someday so I can do whatever I want. No. There's this thin line we walk. God is the author of our salvation. He will complete it in us. But he's asked us to be participators in the growth, in following Jesus, pursuing him, making decisions day to day what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. So Paul has a motto for that. In chapter 1, he's in jail, remember? in jail, doesn't know if he's getting out or not. And he tells the Philippians, I may be put to death, I may be get out. I hope I get out so I can be more benefit to your salvation and your growth, but I might go to heaven. I don't know. That's where he says in chapter 1, verse 21, for to me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. That is Paul's motto. That is Paul's motto. If the theme of the book is pursuing maturity in Christ Jesus, Paul's motto to accomplish that end is if I'm alive, I'm living for Jesus. Every area of my life, every breath I take, I want to filter through that idea to live as Christ. But if I do get put to death, if, the, if Caesar determines I am to die now, gain. I go be with Jesus. So I don't know. Is that just for apostles, you think? Is that commitment 
to live as Christ in every aspect of my life, every breath I take, just for apostles and the rest of us can relax a little? I don't think so either. I think Paul is our example. In fact, he says over and over, follow my example. So in this pursuit of maturity, pursuit of becoming like Christ, the motto Paul had was to live as Christ, to die is gain. Paul goes on in chapter one to talk about this maturity that we're seeking requires unity and humility as its foundation. I I firmly believe this. I've always felt this was true, but this book drove that belief home in me so deep that for me to actually become like Jesus, I first must have a unity with you. Church unity is incredibly important in the Bible. And not just at 300 Country Club Drive, but over on Northwood is another church. Word of, just my brain dead, not Word of Life. New Life, thank you. My, he's been pastor's been my friend for 10 years, I should remember his church. <clears throat> we have Village Presbyterian. We have multiple churches in North Tahoe that we are one body of Christ. Remember, I've asked you many times, how many churches in North Tahoe? One, and we happen to attend assembly at this address. There's one church. We need to realize that. There's a unity God has created that we easily destroy with our selfishness, our pettiness. And so always keep that in mind, a unity. Listen to verse 27, chapter 127. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. So Paul's concern for the, the, the Philippians is a unity first, then second, a humility. He goes on in chapter 2, even though I have this under chapter 1, he goes on in chapter 2, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. So, humility, I don't believe anyone can grow to Christ-likeness if they don't have a humble heart and humble spirit. If pride rules you at any level, that will stop you, it will stunt you from ever becoming like Jesus. It is a core foundational spiritual attribute to become like Christ, to be humble. And we talked about the definition of humility. Paul gives it right here. He says, consider others as more significant than yourselves. Now, one translation says, consider others as more important than yourself. And what I want you to understand, I said this before many times, and I'll say it again till the day I die. This verse here is not telling you, oh, just look at yourself as a worm that crawled out from under a rock. So unfortunately, our Christian theology sometimes says, in order to emphasize how sinful we are, we just keep that as your primary identity forever. Forgetting the redemption we have when God has changed us and forgiven us and made us children of God. But what we don't want to have is then is an arrogance that comes up and says, hey, I'm very important. I'm a child of God. What he's saying here is, in light of knowing who you are, you need to see yourself as God sees you. But when you relate to the people around you, you need to consider them as more significant than you, as more important than you. It's not self-deprecation, well, I'm just a loser anyways. It's actually having a good view of yourself, a healthy view of yourself. I am a born-again, forgiven, redeemed, changed child of God. And now I have the Spirit of God living in me, and I can, He empowers me to now serve you. And so since we preached this, this was probably three months ago, I probably preached on that passage, or two months ago, I forget. I said, what does that mean for me personally? You know, as a pastor of a church, you guys are wonderful to me. You, you, you love me. You, you're so kind to Teresa and I. It's easy to be able to, you know, I also may be able to pedestal and get a little higher up here, you know. Um, you guys treat me so well. And what happens when you get on that pedestal? It's, it's, a, it's a long fall. And so... So it's like, okay, God, what are you asking me to do when it comes to humility for me? And the way I'm trying to implement this in my life is that when it comes to humility, consider others more important, I'm trying to defer all credit and glory to other people. We all work in teams. No no one is a loner here. We do things together that people say, good job. 
And I think what true humility says is, is you know what? Thank you. But so-and-so really gets the credit. You should give the credit to them. This isn't self, um, false humility, but a genuine realization that other people are more important than me and more significant than me. And when we have that genuine understanding of what God, how God wants me to treat you and you treat me, it's amazing, not self-deprecation, but genuine humility that says, let's lift other people up and not worry about whether we get lifted up. You understand that? God says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. And what's the rest of the verse? And he will exalt you. Let God exalt you. You spend your time exalting other people. That's what I'm trying to do. <clears throat> Unity requires humility. So those two foundational aspects. In chapter 2, we move into this idea of humility. And we have a phenomenal example. It is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. After Paul tells us to do that, he says, be like Jesus. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to stand up. Literally, stand up. <laughs> this isn't one of those spiritual things, you know, fall down in your mind. But um, we're going to read Philippians chapter 2, 5 through 11. And let's not rush through it. Let's just read through it and look at Jesus, the incarnate God. God became human as an example to us of what true humility is. And as we look at this, let me give you this imagery again. Remember I did this. For you to humble yourself below everyone around you is a step from here to here. Because ultimately we're equals. You just make sure you, you lift other people up instead of yourself. Christ is, I can't reach high enough to tell you where Christ was in glory. And what did he do? He humbled himself to being murdered on a cross. The death of a rebellious slave. That's the level of his humility. Let's read this and give him honor. Verse 5. Out loud with me. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. At the, at the Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And everyone said? Amen. Remember what hallelujah means? What is it? Praise yeah, praise Yah, shortened form of Yahweh. Hallelujah. Hallel means praise in Hebrew. And Yah is the shortened form of Yahweh. Praise Yahweh. Praise God. So, let's read that last. Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That is the word, quoting from Isaiah 45, Yahweh. Every tongue is to confess that Jesus is the God of the universe. And our response is, hallelujah. So let's read it again, and I'm going to call for you to respond that way. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to glory of God the Father. Hallelujah. hallelujah. Please be seated. <clears throat> so Paul goes on in that chapter to talk about our response to Christ's lordship. If he truly is the glorious God of the universe, and he humbled himself to the point of death on a cross, and God exalted him back up to where everyone eventually will bow their knee to Jesus and say, you are the Lord. You are Yahweh. Everyone will bow. The question is, do we bow in this life or the next? And if I understand the Bible right, in this life is the only chance we have to truly gain eternal life. In the next one, everyone who rejected him in this life will still bow. But it's not going to get him anything. It's just giving Jesus the glory to his name. So Paul goes on to tell us what our response is in chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. And this is a hard verses to read. We don't know what to do with these verses. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only in my presence but much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. 
Will you admit with me, it's really hard to understand today in our, our world why our God is so kind and loving and gracious and merciful. And he is, is he not? Why do I fear him? Why do I fear? It says, work out your salvation in fear and trembling. Those are strong words to understand the God you serve. And those words follow on the hill that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is God himself. So our response needs to, that's where humility comes in and says, I deserve nothing from you, but you've given me everything in fear and trembling. And we ask this question, you know, because frankly, the apostles, arguably speaking, it's possible that the apostle John was Jesus' best friend. Okay? Arguably speaking, the, the, the disciple whom Jesus loved is what John, who's John is called. None of the disciples have that title. The apostle John was the disciple whom Jesus loved. So you think John would understand who Jesus is and not worry about this fear and trembling thing. Go to Revelation chapter 1. John sees the resurrected, glorified Jesus in a vision. I don't think it was a vision. I think he was actually transported to the presence of Jesus. But he sees Jesus in all his glory. The description is unbelievable. And what did John do? Jesus, great to see you, buddy. What did he do? Fell down as a dead man. But this is Jesus' best friend. No, this is Jesus' best friend's response to see the glory of his Lord. So we are to work out our salvation in fear and trembling. It is God who is working in us. He will accomplish it. But our response is a submission in obedience. Well, Timothy and Epaphroditus are examples of this servanthood. We move into chapter 3, and I believe Paul hits the crescendo of his argument in chapter 3 here. See, Paul has an impressive pedigree. Think about what, remember the things he said. Help me remember. Maybe you're reading it. So Paul was born a Hebrew, right? Born an Israelite. What, what tribe? Benjamin. Benjamin. Okay. When was he circumcised? The eighth day, which is what every good Jewish family would do, circumcise their male the eighth day. And it says he was the tribe of Benjamin, which, which to him, evidently, that's, that's the tough guys in his mind. And it says he was a Hebrew of Hebrews. What did that mean? Do you remember? He spoke the language they spoke. In other words, a whole lot of Jews lived in the world that no longer spoke the Jewish language. But he was, he was truly who he was because he spoke the language. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. You guys are all claimed to be Jews, but do you speak the language? That's kind of a, you know, any, you know like anyone raised in a, um, a second generation, third generation immigrant loses the language of their, their parents' home country. Um, my son, who I've adopted, we've adopted, his name's Eric, and he, he's, he's from Mexico, or his family is. And he'll go into a store, and um, they'll speak Spanish to him. And he'll go, I don't speak Spanish. He'll go, yes, you do. <laughs> no, I don't. You know, because he, he, his, his parents never taught him the language. So Mexican descent, but doesn't speak Spanish. And sometimes I go, well, why don't you? If you're Mexican, you should speak Spanish. That's Paul's point. I'm a Hebrew, but I'm really important because I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. And he goes on, I'm a persecutor of the church. When it comes to the law, I am blameless. So Paul gives his pedigree. And it's quite a pedigree. But he says, you know what? I abandon all of that. I abandon it all to know Jesus Christ. Listen to 7 through 11. But whatever gain I had, referring to what his pedigree gave him, I count as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. So the word rubbish there can refer to excrement. Um, it's a word to describe that which you really don't want. So Paul says, that's gone. I count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes from faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith so that I may know him, here it is, that I may know him the power of his resurrection, and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. So we have no problem with that. I want to know Jesus and the power of his resurrection. Anyone here agree with me? 
I mean, what a glorious thing to have the power of God in me who raised Christ from the dead. And I want to know what it's like to suffer with Jesus. Anyone with me? Much less enthusiasm for that one usually. We've kind of taken that one out of the American gospel. Because all suffering must be bad. God wouldn't want you to suffer. Paul's suffering right now. He's in prison for preaching the gospel. I want to know Jesus. Everything about it. I want to know the power of the resurrection. I want to know the fellowship of his suffering. So that someday I may attain to the resurrection also. Because that's the hope we have. So you need to think about that, folks. About what it means to look at your pedigree and say, knowing Jesus is way more important than that. And if that gets in the way of knowing Jesus, it's rubbish. It's dung. You look around this room, we have a lot of people in here who could say, you know, yeah, but I, I've done this, I've done that. I was thinking about naming some things, but I don't want to embarrass anybody. So, some of you have a servant's heart. You serve people left and right. Some of you are greatly accomplished in business and do very good at what you do. And we can go on and on. And nothing's wrong with those things. Nothing was wrong with Paul's pedigree. But he said, that actually hindered me from knowing Jesus. And knowing Jesus is the most important thing I need in this life. Nothing compares. It's all like rubbish to me if it stops me from knowing Jesus. And this is the whole thing about pressing on, reaching as far as you can reach to grab hold of what following Jesus looks like. That's that participatory, participatory process. So then he goes on to the passage we start on. Pressing on to maturity that comes from knowing Christ. At the end of that chapter, he says, we are awaiting a savior from heaven. You see, your salvation is not complete until the day Christ returns and raises you from the dead. Either he returns in our lifetime, which would be wonderful, wouldn't it? A little more enthusiasm on that one. Um, every generation should hope for the coming of Christ. But he hasn't come yet. So whether he comes when I'm still alive or I die and I'm in the ground, Christ is going to return and raise us from the dead. If you're still alive, he will literally, instantly, you have a body like his. If you're dead in the ground, he will raise your body up to be incorruptible. And sin and pain and death is all gone. The entirety of all Christ did for us on the cross will be applied to us at that moment. Utterly, completely saved. That is what we are waiting for. If we put our hope in anything less than that, we'll be disappointed. So, let me read to you verses 20 and 21. But our citizenship is in heaven. And from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Remember we did this? We kind of, we kind of brainstormed about what, body, like, what Jesus' body was like. Remember that? What are some of the things Jesus could do after he was raised from the dead that he couldn't do before? Or maybe he could do, but he still does them. Okay, walk through walls. And I say it different, Pam. I say he, he's there and he materialized here. Did he walk through the wall or did the walls in it? It doesn't matter. I don't know. That's cool. Kind of dangerous, actually, in this world. What else could Jesus do? He ate. So we still get to eat. Man, I can't wait. Because there's no calories then. And I realize that's my interpretation. But um, it's neat to think through all the things that Jesus did. I, according to this, I have a body just like his. There's my hope. At that moment... My pursuit of Christ, that I press on, the zeal I have, reaching forward, forgetting what lies behind, reaching forward, I want you, Jesus. All that comes to its fruition. And Christ says, now, he said it at the cross, it is finished. I have accomplished your salvation. But now he's going to say, it is truly finished in your life. You are now 100% fully saved. And you have been restored back to my image. That's what we're looking for, folks. The day Christ restores back in us the image of God utterly without blemish. What a wonderful day that will be. Chapter 4, Paul goes into some practical matters. Tells these two women to get along, quit fighting. And then he talks about, and Ron preached on this, anxiety, prayer, and thanksgiving. 
But don't be anxious for anything. But by prayer and supplication, make your requests known to God with gratitude. If, if I could add, if I could add to unity and humility is a foundation. The next thing is, are you grateful? Are you a grateful person? Or do you look at him and say, but you owe me. Unity, humility is the foundation. I think the next step is thanksgiving. But listen to 4.8. We all love this verse. How are you to spend your days? Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. So our daily life, and I jokingly, I jokingly say this, but it's not a joke. If I truly live that, everything in life, I'd probably never turn my TV on. Not as a point of legalism, but as a point is not much at a TV does that. Okay, Michelle, maybe a few Hallmark movies. <laughs> Just a little follow-up on my joke a couple weeks ago. Um, as followers of Jesus, pressing forward to grab a hold of him, becoming like him, we need to commit that to memory and ask ourselves every day, is this how I'm spending my time thinking and pursuing? Then the last part was Paul being grateful for the gifts given to him by the Philippians. He talked about contentment. And he said, whether I have a lot or I have a little, I'm content. And that's another thing. You know, if, the, if humility and unity is the foundation, gratitude follows, I think what's next for each of us is what does it mean to be content? Usually we talk about contentment and I, I don't have something I want. We'll be content. But what's it mean to be content when you have a lot? Sometimes that word doesn't apply to a lot because I have way more than I need. So I want you to think about that. What does contentment mean whether I have a little or a lot? Contentment seems to be separate, utterly separate from what I have. So we need to think about that. Unity, humility, gratitude, and contentment. All of those are Christ-like characters, characteristics. And that's what we're pursuing. So that is my 30-minute review of the book of Philippians. <laughs> I'm not done, though. We're going to start a new series in February. But we have two more weeks in January. I want you to know, it's January 26th. We're going to have our annual, boy, I, I detest the term business meeting. So I'm not going to say that. We're going to have our annual vision casting meeting. It'll be after church on the 26th. I tell you now, so you put it in your calendars, to stay after church. Um, but the next two weeks, we're going to have, I'm going to have messages that lead up to that meeting and talk about why this church exists and the vision we have to see Christ grown in you and Christ proclaimed in our communities. Then after that, we'll have that meeting. And I know that you'll put it on your calendar and you will not leave church at 11 o'clock. That was a guilt trip. So I started this off saying, um, lukewarmness is not the calling. Someone sent me a sermon recently. I didn't listen to it. Not because it was wrong. I just didn't do it. But it was titled by Francis Chan. Lukewarm and okay with it. Lukewarm and okay with it. And obviously, Francis Chan's point was, and I didn't listen to it, so I should do that before I quote him, was why are we okay with, with mediocrity? Why are we okay with it? And the book of Philippians has just drilled into my heart and mind that all that truly matters in this life is pursuing Jesus. And once we do that, I'm not talking about business is not important, your job, your entertainment, all that is important. It's all part of being human. But if I'm pursuing Jesus, then he informs every area of my life. But if I simply have every area of my life and I simply tack Jesus on as the fifth, tenth, twentieth thing, that is mediocrity. So that's been what Philippians has been about in my life, and you're going to hear about it again next week in a different form. Because I believe, folks, that 
Christ is calling Cornerstone Community Church to fully grasp what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Tomorrow morning in Mark, now I'm off script now. Tomorrow morning in Mark, if you get that email in Mark, Jesus says to Peter and Andrew, follow me. First he says, repent and believe. Then he comes up to Peter and Andrew and says, follow me. Goes down the beach a little bit to their partners, John and James, and says, follow me. What do they do? They, they're doing the fishing business. They drop it all and follow Jesus. Complete and utter commitment to the purposes of Christ. Let's pray. Father, I want that for myself. I want that for all of us, Lord. And we all know, I know, we all know, Lord, that we fall far short of that right now. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your kindness. That you'll never leave us or forsake us. Um, and I know you are working, Lord. He says you will never stop working in us to accomplish these things. So those areas, Lord, that hinder that, wake us up. Show it to us, Lord. Just starkly show us what we need to set aside. What we need to stop doing that and pursue that, Lord. Put off, put on. Replace our passions with your son. So, Lord, keep us on that precipice, Lord, of pursuing you. And only be guided by your power doing it. Not self-righteousness and not, not antinomianism. <laughs> A freedom to do whatever we want because we know you love us, Lord. No, help us never to go down those two sides. You are good to us, Lord. Open our eyes to your goodness and your greatness. Thank you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.